So thank you all for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Robert Underwood. And as you just heard, this was Mackenzie Benz. We're going to be presenting today on um, writing secure applications. So just kind of an overview of what we're going to be talking to about today. We're going to be talking about what are secure applications and why we care about them. After we've done that, we're going to move into the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. We're going to talk about what they are, how bad they are, how to help identify them if you encounter them, and then how to mitigate against them. Because the focus, again, with this, these presentations is to really talk about not necessarily now that you found it, oh, dang, it's broke, we can't do anything. But we want to actually try to motivate some ways that you can actually prevent these types of exploitations in the future. And as Max said, we will then transition to talking about some other more traditional application vulnerability types. So why secure applications? So according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, a department in the Department of Justice, uh, in 2005, they published a document which, which outlined different security vulnerabilities, how much damage they did. Um, I tried to find something newer, but unfortunately, they're all classified, <laughs> which I guess is kind of the a good thing that happens when you interact with the federal government. But apparently, uh, of the businesses that they surveyed, they surveyed, I think it was like 2,000 businesses, 67% of them, 67 of them had been exposed to some type of cybercrime. Um, and of those surveyed, 60% experienced more than one threat, which means that not only were they exposed to website traditional hacking, but also perhaps phishing scams, situations where their users' data was collected, basically they were attacked on multiple fronts. So this is becoming a big issue. And all of these statistics that I'm talking about today constitute what happened before Home Depot was hacked in 2012, uh, or 2014. 2014. Target was hacked in 2012. And PlayStation was hacked in... 2013. Yeah. I think that was SQL injection. And all of these exploitations happened just recently. Um, McAfee, which is a major security firm, treat them as you would, They've estimated that the costs related to cyber-related crimes somewhere between 24 and 120 <coughs> billion dollars. Um, so there is definitely a motivation and a need to write and use secure applications. So the question then is, what kinds of vulnerabilities exist, and then what can we actually start to do about them? And to kind of piggyback off of that, <coughs> he listed some big name companies because you guys all have a frame of reference for what those companies do and how they interact with the world. But this just doesn't apply to them. It applies to you know the mom and pop shop in your city who the wife might have set up the website and she has no idea what she's doing, but she's handling credit card transactions uh, on the same server as her website's hosted and stuff like that. You know, It's not just these larger businesses that are getting attacked, it's the smaller ones because they're low hanging fruit. They're the easiest to get to. They might not have the resources to track you down and arrest you. Um, so those factor into that 60% statistic, and it might even be greater than if you take into those businesses into account because that might just not be an all-reaching thing. That might be a major corporation type statistic. Okay. So now comes the question of how severe are these types of exploits against our services? So when we talk about exploits on servers, we generally talk about in terms of severity, four different kinds of areas. We talk about attack vectors, the weakness prevalence, the weakness detectability, and the technical impacts. So attack vectors is the question of where can we attack this from? Do I need to be physically in front of the computer typing away on a keyboard or jack my ethernet cable into some server switch in order to get access to this system? Or can I be over here at my house in my pajamas and just do, 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 do. Oh, got root on the server, and keep going. This also applies to surface area, and it's not just like whether you have to be there, is the system air-gapped, it's like what do they have running, which ports are open, how you can get there. Uh, surface area plays a large role in cybersecurity, because if you had to fence in a front yard of a small house, it's pretty easy. But if you have to fence in this farm that's 50 acres huge, you're not going to use the same quality fence. You're not going to use a privacy fence to fence that in. You're going to use one of those wooden fences with two holes, and you're going to call it a day. So there's a lot more gap in a large organization when they have more surface area. The next topic that we want to talk about here with like how severe a vulnerability is is the weakness prevalence. So for example, if 
there was some vulnerability that you could exploit remotely, but it's only used on one server that contains max personal information, nobody cares. Um, I care. I mean, Mac cares. <laughs> grand scheme of things, nobody cares. But if it's a vulnerability in, like, for example, the GNU C library, which almost everyone has installed on any Unix-compliant operating system, except for the BSDs, of course. Um, they have their own. Yeah, they have their own BSD C library. But any Linux-based operating system is going to have GNU C. And when that's taken into account, something that was previously a small, oh, one, got, one institution uses this vulnerability, suddenly every single application that was compiled against GNU C is now vulnerable. Which is in the billions. So weakness prevalence, like how widespread the vulnerability is, is definitely important in considering how severe it is. Um, weakness detectability. This is the question of if the vulnerability exists on a system, how easy it, is it to figure out if that system is vulnerable. So do I have to have physical access in order to determine whether it's vulnerable or can I determine if a system has the vulnerability remotely? Can I figure out if the system has the vulnerability without setting off any alarms that may exist in the um, IDS that the company may have deployed? Or is it something that if I do it, they're going to immediately catch me with a red flag and hey, someone's doing something fishy, you better figure out what's going on. So detectability is a major role. It's also, you can measure that in, can any Joe Schmo do this? You know, can I sit down at my computer, look at a guide, and then do it? Or do I have to have pretty in-depth knowledge of the operating system, what kernel they're running, what processes are there, and what the source code looks like to perform X attack? Uh, so weakness detectability is not just does it exist, it's also who can do it. And then lastly, in determining how severe a vulnerability is, we have to consider the technical impacts. So these are going to be what can someone do if they have exploited this vulnerability. So for example, something that allows you to execute arbitrary code is obviously much more scary than something that tells you the host name of the system that is running the code. So you do need to kind of consider what exactly you can do with it and then perhaps even possibly think about, do I even care if they can get my host name? And if you're a larger corporation, odds are you don't care because they have bigger fish to fry. So now we're going to move into what are called the OWASP top 10. So OWASP is an, op is an organization which researches security and provides resources both from an educational standpoint of how to identify these vulnerabilities but also some resources on how to fix some of these vulnerabilities. So every couple of years they publish a report called the top 10, which includes what vulnerabilities are the most severe and the most costly to organizations. So we're going to go through these vulnerabilities kind of in order, talking about what exactly the vulnerabilities are and what exactly you can do with them. So we have injection. Uh, injection is pretty common. If you guys have came to any of our meetings, you've heard me mention SQL injection. And it's not just because it's fun to say injection, but it's because Sony, the company you guys probably all play your video games on, fell to it and lost millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of people's credit card information just through typing a string into a unsanitized text input box. That's honestly probably not what happened. It was probably a little more in depth than that, but for the gist of things, that's what we're gonna define this as. So injection is allowing untrusted inputs to the command shells, bash, echo, dollar sign one or SQL, which is what I'm most familiar with, uh, where you pass in a SQL statement and tell the SQL database to interpret this and give you results. So injection can occur in a few different ways. There's incorrectly filtering escape characters, incorrect type handling. Uh, those are some of the more common ones that you get. So incorrectly filtering escape characters is not saying, hey, don't let users put a comment in my particular language in my text input field. So that's kind of like giving the, in a really simple form, giving the text box a black list of things not to allow, like uh, a comment in C, which is forward slash forward slash. Don't allow that. You wouldn't allow that. That's silly. Uh, incorrect type handling is when you don't strongly type your variables or don't check user supply to input. So if a user gives you a string but you were expecting an int and you don't check that, and you just say, oh, that's great, and you run it, 
which you would never do because it would break all your C programs, um, that will cause an injection vulnerability. So to mitigate, mitigate these, uh, OWASP recommends parameterized statements. So instead of creating your select statement here, this template, if you don't parameterize your statement, this template here is built from user input. But when you parameterize your statements, it's built from a compiled template that the SQL database knows is okay, and then user input is plugged in, like you're passing a variable into a C function. You're not building the function, you're just passing things in, which is a whole lot safer than letting the person write their function, right? You wouldn't, you would never let them do that. Uh, then there's escaping, so this is really fragile um, and easily worked around because you can't catch everything. They're gonna figure it out, they're gonna get you, um, but it's a pretty simple to implement standard way to just kind of get the gist of things as far as SQL injection is aware. So you just escape characters like comments, uh, single quotes, if you put a single quote, you wanna make sure there's a following single quote. You don't wanna leave it open. You wanna make sure everything's closed and opened appropriately when you're building these templates if you're not parameterizing your statements. Uh, pattern checking, you wanna ensure that the input follows a pattern, so if you're expecting month, month, day, day, year, you wanna make sure that pattern is followed. If it's not, it could quite possibly be a SQL injection, don't accept the input. Um, database permissions, so the text box on a website is usually an account in a database, and that account has specific access to everything. You wouldn't want that account to be root, so they don't have access to everything. And that kind of goes along with what we're gonna get over into later is file permissions. Databases also have permissions. So databases are built on a bunch of tables, and certain accounts have permissions to certain tables, and they can read certain table values. So you just wanna make sure that user input box doesn't have permissions to read what they're not allowed to read, so, such as credit cards. And hexing input is converting it in, like a string or an int to hex decimal and then unconverting it back. In SQL and PHP, the unconversion process turns it into a string which is not interpreted by the database. So that's a really good way to ensure that SQL injection isn't gonna happen. Um, and for a little antidote, the Swedish general election in 2010, somebody wrote SQL injection on the electronic voting machines and injected the voting software and rigged the election. So that's kind of what you can do with SQL injection if stuff's not properly handled. And we're gonna move on. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about here is what I'm gonna, what OWASP calls broken session management. So this can take several different forms, but usually it revolves around one of two things, either predictable or unprotected authentication. So what exactly does that mean? Um, that could be things where you allow credentials that are flat out not encrypted, like for example, sending a password in plain text across the internet. Um, you should never do that. Um, likewise, if you're, say, maybe you did some encoding, but you like put it in base 64, or you put it in hex, again, no, that doesn't fly. Um, or it could be that your session credentials are consistent or predictable. So imagine if Whenever you, you, did, you read somewhere, oh, I need to have a session ID so I can figure out like tracking user sessions one to one, and I can know what those sessions are. What if I just like, we'll just increment a counter every time we're going through the program, and then eventually that should give us something that you know, seems relatively reasonable. But what that really means is that all someone has to do is, okay, so I got session cookie 114, Odds are, this is a pretty busy site, session cookie 115 also exists, and I can now do something with that. Uh, likewise, sessions that don't expire or timeout um, can also potentially have a problem. Because once a session cookie becomes valid at that point, it can then be used over and over again until the end of time. The so, heat death of the universe. Which, to put that in perspective. Yeah, so what that means is that someone can do really kind of shady things and access things that they're not supposed to be. So where might you actually see this? So um, I was working on a program one time and I was looking at the authentication code that they were using to log on to the system. And what I found was they actually sent the root username and password in plain text across the network. 
Um, so just think about that for a second. What could you do with a root username and password on a system that has SSH enabled? Anything more you think. What? Everything. So broken session management is this high on the list because once you've broken the session management or broken the authentication system, you probably have access to literally everything. As anybody. And as everybody. Any mitigations that you may have that allow you to track what users are doing and try to come back to particular users no longer really apply because you're not necessarily guaranteed that a user is who they actually claim to be. Um, so it is incredibly important to practice good session management techniques. So how exactly do we mitigate this? One, we should always encrypt authentication credentials as they're going across the network. And that means using standard cryptographic functions, things like RSA or things like um, AES. We need to use standard functions and not roll our own crypto. Because when you roll your own crypto, it becomes increasingly easy to crack it. There are only like a couple cryptographic functions that are considered secure, and I'm using air quotes here for those listening at home. So the odds that you make a new function that also is quote unquote secure is incredibly small. And we find example after example in the news of where people rolled their own cryptography and it ended up biting them in the butt. So don't roll your own crypto and definitely encrypt everything with a standard encryption function. Unless you have some PhD in cryptography, then go for it. Yeah. But additionally, yeah, yeah. Additionally, session credentials are consistent or predictable. So don't give the user back the same session credential every single time they log on. That's a bad idea. Second of all, don't make it predictable. So don't make it, for example, like increasing numbers or the result of some linear equation or quadratic equation for that matter. If it becomes easy enough that someone can like plot your session credentials that you hand out to people over time and figure out what your function is, that's probably a bad idea. Um, and then finally, you want to implement session timeouts so that session cookies become invalid after a certain amount of time. Just kind of imagine if you walked away from an ATM and you just stayed logged in. That's kind of what that is. So don't do that. <coughs> Cross-site scripting. So this is a bunch of fun. So cross-site scripting is scary. Um, and it's basically saying, hey, web server, display my function. And that can be as benign as hello user or give me your session cookie, which as Robert has explained is a bad thing. You don't want, to, you want some random stranger to have access to your session cookie. So a whitelist, which is on here, is just saying, hey, accept scripts from these sources, accept only things from these sources. Nowhere else is okay. So cross-site scripting attacks uh, use known vulnerabilities in a scripting engine to harvest credentials or pass on malware or run arbitrary code on a web server. Uh, plugins are particularly vulnerable to this and forums that support HTML uh, even though it's a subset of HTML, it's pretty hard to sanitize that user input because it just starts a large array of just stuff. There's just so many options that somebody could just type into the, your little forum board that supports HTML. And to sanitize that is a, a massive undertaking. Um, so usually it's JavaScript. Uh, I can't think of any other cross-site scripting language off the top of my head right now. PHP. Is PHP used? If you use P Yeah, okay. So CSS3 is Turing complete, and you can do sometimes bad things or things that are not intended in it, but generally it always means JavaScript. Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So there are a few types of cross-site scripting. There is reflective, which is a non-persistent form of cross-site scripting. And uh, that's, I'm going to say not as bad. It's still bad. Uh, there's worse types of cross-site scripting. So reflective is a potential vector is a site search engine. So let's say you search something on a website and it displays your search string here, right? So that search string is plugged into HTML. <coughs> so if you just put the HTML script tags and you link it to a JavaScript 
That's probably hosted on your own computer or your website that's internet accessible. It'll run it if it's not properly sanitized. Which means that when somebody visits that, that script is being ran on their computer. So this is non-persistent. This is, again, I'm gonna say not as bad because it goes away. There's what's called persistent. It doesn't go away. And it goes to everybody who ever accesses that page ever. So let's say you go to a news forum and the comment section allows HTML. And then somebody just types up, let's, let's say the video is about puppies playing soccer. That's gonna get a ton of views on Facebook because everybody's gonna click the share button. It's gonna 100,000 people. I'm probably gonna click it because it's adorable. But some malicious person goes in the comment section and writes, I love puppies, that video was adorable. You're like, oh, that's great, yep, I agree. But embedded in that is gonna be a script tag that says, run this script and grab this person's cookie. And now they can impersonate me on that website because they have my session cookie. I didn't know it because it didn't do anything to my web browser. I didn't see it. It's not showing up in plain text that she has script tags because HTML is abstracting that away and just saying, run the script. So that's bad news bears, and that's gonna happen to everybody who goes to that website. So prevention, because you wanna mitigate this clearly, is escaping the string input. So just not letting them put script tags all over your website is probably a good place to start. Um, validating untrusted user input. So yeah, you're gonna wanna make sure that the stranger that's giving you input is not trying to make you jump off a bridge. It, you, you want to make sure that the stranger is like <clears throat> giving you good input. It's hard to give an example because it's such an abstract concept. There's a ton of user input you can get. You just want to ensure they're not handing you a script. Uh, disable scripts. Uh, that, yeah, disable scripts. The issue with that is, is it makes modern web browsing kind of hard. Um, everything uses scripts. Uh, it's really difficult to do. There's some nice programs, um, uh, script lock or what's it called? Um, no script. No script. script. Thank you. It's essential. It's. It also conveniently like get rid of most advertisements that yeah. you will ever see. It does do that, <laughs> but you also have to click allow script fifty times. To. Allow scripts. Have you ever tried? Everybody, when you get home, give it a whirl. Browse the internet without scripts and tell me how terrible it's it is. It's, it's terrible. So you can disable scripts and for cookie security, so if you just all else fails and your site's cross scripted, you wanna make sure the session cookies that these people are harvesting are secure, quote unquote, for those of you listening at home. Um, so you wanna tie the cookie to the IP. Unfortunately, that falls apart pretty quickly if they're behind the same netted address or the same proxy because they share the same IP. Um, and that's just gonna fall apart really quickly. So if you're sitting in the same coffee shop as somebody, you're probably gonna have a similar IP. And go ahead. Insecure direct object references. So a direct object reference is likely to occur when the developer exercises a reference to an object in code that they didn't expect. So let's say you return an ID. That's a direct object reference. That ID is corresponding to some object somewhere else, maybe a file name or something along those lines. And as a developer, you want to try to not let the user see what's going on behind the curtain. Uh, sometimes you have to, but you want to make sure that the permissions to that file or the other files surrounding it don't allow that user to manipulate it. Um, so prevention is just checking the access before you let the file be used from an untrusted source. If it's a trusted source, I'd still say check the access, but it's usually pretty safe. Yeah, so just as kind of an example here, allowing, um, you've probably seen sites where they have like page equals like about or page equals home. Like if you can do page equals slash Etsy password, probably a bad thing. Probably a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't necessarily just have to be files on the disk. It could actually also be things like database objects where you've allowed someone to go in and modify or have access to some file that they're not supposed to. This is 
commonly combined with things like symbolic link vulnerabilities where the permissions on a symbolic link are slightly different than the file that they're pointing to, mm -hmm. allowing someone to gain elevated privileges on a file or a set of files that they otherwise would not have had access to. And if you guys are doing over the wire, Leviathan, that's mostly symbolic linking, just hint, hint. Oh, security misconfiguration. Uh, really, I don't have much to say about this besides keep your stuff up to date. Uh, CVEs, if you guys don't know what a CVE is, it's a common vulnerability. Exploits, I guess. Common <laughs> vulnerability exploits. Um, and there's a giant list of database, databases out there that contain a list of vulnerabilities for all of the software you run and all of its older versions. Newer versions usually are day zero exploits, which don't get posted on CVEs, which make a hacker who isn't into zero days, which is the first person deploying this exploit, is life much harder because your software is up to date and there's not a common cookie trail to follow to get access. So patch your stuff, keep it up to date. Okay, so very related to what I talked about first with broken session management is this idea of sensitive data exposure. Um, basically, this is sending anything that you don't want sent in plain text in plain text or in some other loosely veiled attempt at cryptography. Um, so for example, if you're going to apply for housing for the next semester and on the site that you're looking at, they're using just a normal HTTP and they ask for your social security number. This would be an example of, in the wild example of improper secure sensitive data exposure. Anybody with a quote unquote privileged network position, i.e. they're on the same network as you, can then go and say, ooh, look at this traffic that's coming by. Oh, hey, that's max social security number. I wonder what I could do with this. Yeah, no, you don't really want to allow things like that. There's also things like insecure cryptography. So at one point in the United States is infinite wisdom in history, we decided that we weren't going to allow other countries to have strong cryptographic connections with sites inside of the US. This technology and this thing was commonly referred to as export grade cryptography. So for example, if Mac and I are in the United States, we can talk to each other with 4096 bit encryption. But if I'm talking to Nick over here, Nick is in Europe, is in Europe we can only talk with 128-bit encryption. Now that can be cracked by your local home desktop. Yeah, and even if it's a little bit stronger, say 256 bits, um, $100 on the Amazon EC2 Compute Cloud, and you can actually break the keys that are of that size. So one of the vulnerabilities that you'll see a lot of times nowadays, kind of stemming from this export crypto issue that we had, is we would have sites that say, hey, I'm in Europe, you need to send me export grade crypto. So then the server says, well, okay, I guess I'll send you export grade crypto. I don't have anything telling me not to. So I'll connect to you and I will allow export grade crypto. Well, what you normally see in these situations is the key that they use for export crypto is actually derived from the original key that they're using as their master key for the site. So with a hundred bucks on Amazon EC2, you've suddenly cracked the master key for that website and now can read any and all secure communication going to that site. Including US 496 bit. Yeah, because no, we've since removed the restrictions for export grade crypto, but that doesn't mean that the code that actually implemented it is gone. Um, for example, how many of you have heard of the SSL drowned vulnerability? Basically at the heart of that vulnerability is basic ser servers requesting old versions of RSA, which are no longer secure because computers have become faster than they once were. Fedora isn't drowning, by the way. Yes, they're not. <laughs> uh, but there are also vulnerabilities, like for example, Logjam, which does a very similar attack, I believe, on SSH. Uh, Parker? Uh, 128 bit is fine if it's symmetric, something like AES is fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I was speaking about RSA, but yes, uh, your point is well taken. Um, the problem with symmetric encryption though is you have to share the key and if you're sending that key over something that's not secure, like 128-bit right. RSA's non-insymmetric yeah. key or asymmetric, uh, 
then you might as well have gone ahead and just sent the whole thing on encrypted. Yeah, but our RSA's key slide seems to be significantly higher than AES's in order to maintain integrity. Yes. Um, so use AES is what he's saying. Yeah. And I agree. Well, anywho. The, the point is, do your research, be careful, select secure cryptography. Now, how on earth do you mitigate this? Because, as I said, the code that allows this export grade crypto still exists. So what you can do in a lot of cases is actually there's a configuration file which lists the allowable ciphers that you can use. Simply don't include the export grade ones in the list. It's as simple as that. Now, some people will say, oh my goodness, that'll break compatibility with Internet Explorer version eight. If they're visiting your site in Internet Explorer version eight, you probably don't want to allow them to visit your site in the first place. Um, display a helpful message encouraging them to get a secure web browser and move on with your life. Uh, it will make the security of everyone better off. What version is Internet Explorer right now? Okay. Yeah, so I guess 12, 12 at this point. All right. Um, but, or, oh my gosh, there will break connections to Raspberry Pis. You don't probably want a Raspberry Pi talking to your server in the first place. Or on the internet, unless you really need it on the internet. Yeah, you probably want those on some sort of internal network where they can't be touched or talked to by anything that isn't explicitly allowed. So. That's called air gapping? Yeah. So the important part, point here is don't allow insecure cryptography and try to use secure cryptography whenever you need to transport secure information. Uh, by the way, SSL certs are now free thanks to um, Let's Encrypt, so you have no excuse at this point. Enough said. <laughs> All right. Missing function level access control. <laughs> it's possible to bypass access controls, protecting admin but not admin users, or authentication checks done user side. So I'm going to ask you guys this question. Should you do authentication checks user side? And if any of you say yes, we're going to have to have a chat. <laughs> um, having, giving somebody the permission to say, I'm not a thief, and then giving them the key to your house, to not burglarize it is a bad idea. So don't do that. <laughs> so when you're doing <laughs> access controls, set up access controls as an umbrella. You want to cover everything under, let's say, admin. You want to cover admin users. You want to cover et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just cover everything under that umbrella that needs to be covered. Otherwise, you're going to have bad things happening when somebody's like, oh, I can't get into admin but I wonder if I can do admin users. So just make sure everything else has the correct access control for its parent. Mm -hmm. That's all I gotta say on that. Yeah, so what this generally looks like in code is basically any module that's underneath admin, at least at a minimum validating the session cookie and making sure that the session cookie, if not, for at least in some cases, you actually want to re-require authentication. Like for example, if someone's adding SSH keys to your GitHub account, you know how they make you log in again? That's basically just ensuring that no one stole your SSH key or stole your authentication in order to get into that account. So at minimum, <laughs> a child should have the same access controls as the parent, if not greater. At minimum, same. Cross-site request forgery. How many people browse things with a web browser that has a tabbed interface? Everybody. Practically we'll everybody. What? OK, Foster. <laughs> um, if you're using this, technically speaking, depending on exactly how your JavaScript engine is implemented, if they can get into one tab, they can pretty much get into them all. So that means they can take a session cookie from, say, Facebook and then use it someplace else. Or maybe they can, if the site was really poorly written, they have a password cookie that actually has your password in it. Those are fun. Yeah, because I've actually seen those. Yeah, I have too. Um, so if you actually have a, token, a cookie that has the actual password in it, well, odds are, if you're not like security conscious, you probably use the same password multiple places. And even if you are security conscious, you probably use it multiple places. 
Yeah. So if you're using the same password in multiple places, what that means is that I can now take the password that I found for, say, Facebook and then try it at your bank. And then odds are, because humans are humans, I now have access to your bank. So the kind of major issue here is allowing people to steal access to that session cookie using, usually this is combined with like cross-site scripting to harvest the key and then once they've harvested the key, they try to use it in other places. This is a much worse version of cross-site scripting. <laughs> it just, it's your whole browser. It's not just the website, it's not just that little comment section, it's the whole browser. And you've, you've messed up if that happens. And there's actually certain versions of this that stay persistent even if um, you close the tab that had the offending piece of code in it that allowed this to start in the first place. So for those of you who <coughs> are interested by cross-site scripting, a handy dandy tool is called Beefhook. Uh, that makes cross-site scripting fun and really easy. So uh, give it a whirl if you're into it. Uh, the exploitable <laughs> box is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Yes. So. We have one of those spun up. I can send that out in an email later today. And you can give Beefhook a whirl. It's on your Kali Linux distros under favorites, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, the, the point is you want to minimize the ability to use the same authentication request for multiple instances. Another thing that you can do to kind of prevent this is associate a not only like a session ID with each authentication request, but actually a token for the actual authentication itself so that an individual set of authentication requests can only be used once. Um, one place where I saw this actually implemented somewhat well from what I understand, and again, I'm not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination, but basically they hashed the date with the authentication credentials so that the specific authentication request was only good within, I think, two minutes of when the actual request was made. And any re request for authentication with that cookie would have then been invalid any time after. So that's kind of the idea there. Known vulnerable <laughs> components. So a vulnerable component, do you, any of you guys have kind of an idea what a vulnerable component is? Raise some hands. Let's get some interaction going. What's up? Essentially just like using a library that has the problem. So your code doesn't have the problem, it's someone else's fault, but you're still at risk because you're using it. Nailed it. So null and vulnerable components, as he said, is not necessarily you have the problem, but somebody else's stuff has the problem, you're using it. It's like driving your friend's car and the friend's car dies. You don't necessarily, you haven't necessarily killed it, but it's still your problem because you're stranded now. No vulnerable components, they can include anything from like plugins, browser extensions, WordPress. WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> um, those are bad news bears. So finding out if you have a known vulnerable component, there are, it's kind of a mess. It's not great. Uh, CVE and NVD are both, I'd say, top of the line in searching and figuring out if you are vulnerable to this. Uh, I linked it in the notes I sent you guys. So that website that you all got in the second email has links to both of those databases. So for you to find out if you're vulnerable, that's a good place to search. So you're gonna wanna keep a running list of what versions of stuff you're using, what libraries you're using. Uh, if you're writing in C, uh, C libraries. Are PHP. PHP. Uh, definitely PHP. Uh, um, yeah, the vulnerable <laughs> component is in and of itself PHP. But you want to keep a running tab of what versions you have and what versions are vulnerable. And if they match up, I'd update or patch or just get rid of it if there's not an update. If it hasn't been fixed or addressed, get rid of it. It's going to cause you problems, maybe not now, maybe not in a year, but down the road it will cause you problems. So protecting against known vulnerable components, preventative medicine is the best medicine. Uh, just don't install them. Uh, really, that's kind of the go-to. And if you absolutely have to, make sure they're the most up-to-date they can get. Uh, that's kind of what you're working with there. Unless you have access to the source code, then you might be able to fix it yourself, i.e. open source software, which is why people like it. Uh, identify all the components, as I said before. That's something you want to do and ensure that your components are good. There are a few plugins for websites that'll do this. Uh, that'll identify your components and cross-reference them with those databases. 
and it'll flag you if you're, this is vulnerable, or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, establish your secure policies for governing what components go where. Uh, don't just let components go everywhere, like shotgun components. That's bad news. You're going to have a known vulnerable component somewhere. Um, so story time. Who here has taken 215 or 372? Right? Software engineering classes for those listening at home. Software engineering for those listening at home, written in Java, if you're taking it with shop. Um, the Java Spring framework, which is used by a lot of people, has been vulnerable to remote code execution, and that's used in 1.3 million corporate instances, not just personal use, not home computer use, corporate instances were vulnerable to remote code execution <laughs> by an attacker. And remote code execution is probably the worst vulnerability that I can think of to have on a corporate server. Perhaps only shy of privilege escalation. Yeah, only shy of just being root. <laughs> and if you have remote code execution, it's only a matter of time till you're root. So stuff like that that people use all the time in corporations are just vulnerable to remote code execution because they didn't check their databases, they didn't check the zero days, they didn't check their mailing list. Bad IT. Really bad IT. <laughs> and the funny part is, is these companies, a lot of them are still vulnerable because they just haven't updated or patched. Patch is kind of the message I'm getting across to you here. So, Have we spoken to you about the good word of patching? <laughs> um, so the last one that we're going to talk about here is unvalidated redirects and forwards. Um, so how many of you have seen a PHP page where they say index.php equals question mark uh, foobar and it like redirects you to some random page? Most of the time they're not doing that with HTTPS. Um, Almost never. And basically what you can do is when you have a page like that, you can have the prefix of a really good sounding URL like irs.gov. And then you can have this little question mark equals www.evilhostistealyourstuff.com as the redirect. And because you didn't really ever check where you were forwarding the user to, you just kind of let them go there. Um, this is probably one of the fastest things to identify and also one of the easiest ones to fix. Don't use unvalidated redirects and forwards. And if you can help it, just remove the dang redirects to begin with. Or whitelist. Yeah. Like, the easiest solution here is just don't use redirects. If you don't have to, don't use them. Uh, if you're using any sort of static site generation tool, you can actually just generate the appropriate thing and just be done. If you're using dynamic sites, you can generate the appropriate URL to begin with and then be done. There's no point in actually having redirects in your code. That they're annoying. You ever get redirected and you have this splash page, like, you will be redirected in three, two, well, it's really annoying. So the moral of the story is just avoid redirects. <coughs> now we're going to move on to more traditional application vulnerabilities. These are ones that you're going to see more often in your like, native operating system level development. That's not to say that the vulnerabilities that we talked about with web applications also apply to traditional applications, but these are some spe specific additional vulnerabilities that you do want to be aware of. So before we move into this, why don't we take a second do any of you guys have any questions? I know we just threw a lot at you. Um, so is there anything you guys have questions about? I'd like to know more about? Yeah? More of a comment. But actually, um, Facebook has been putting a giant warning message in the developer console saying, if you're here, someone's telling you to put something in this console, don't. If you don't know what you're doing, don't. Because mm -hmm. that has also become a way to do cross-site scripting, having people just put, do it. In, put in code. Because they think it'll let them see their friends something or other, or let them play games or something. And so there's now a giant banner message in the wall that says, you shouldn't be here. Close this out. That's clever. Yeah. That's really clever. That's social engineering right there. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, anything else? No? All right. That was your, uh, that was your break. So we're now we're moving on to traditional aspects. I think improper permissions is mine. <laughs>
Yep. So we're going to be running applications as root that don't require it. Um, most of you who are running Linux are either on the lab machines or on your own home computers. Uh, if you're in Ubuntu, the standard user isn't root. If you're running Fedora or Red Hat, the standard user is root. You should make a separate user, but the standard user is root. It is. Um, I'm almost positive on that one. It asks you to during install to create another user and warns you if you don't. On the server, the standard user is root. Both. Okay. Anyway. Anywho, I could be wrong. <laughs> but most Linux opera operating systems have a separate user that isn't root. You can do root type actions um, as this user if they're administrator and in the group wheel, I think. Is um, by default the one that has root level permissions. Yeah. It, wheel is the one that has root level permissions. So the standard user is what you're going to want to be doing most <laughs> things as. Now, if you're working with system D or something along those lines, yeah, you could probably be root. But running Spotify as root does not ever need to happen. It just, that's silly. Running Google Chrome as root does, definitely doesn't ever need to happen. You don't want to do that. Um, and then we're going to move on to overly wide permissions on files. So I actually just ran into this problem last night and up until about 15 minutes ago where Marshall solved my issue. Uh, the public HTML page on our Linux boxes here at Clemson, I uploaded some website stuff there and I tried to travel to it and I got unauthorized access. Turns out I didn't have my file permission set correctly. Um, for those of who are curious, it is 644 this is the appropriate file permissions and we're going to cover what that means in a second. Directories the X, so 755 for directories. 755? for directories, but okay. the actual files themselves need 644. Okay. Directories is 755, actual files are 644. I'm going to fix that when I get home. But overly wide permissions on files. So who here knows what chmod 777 does? All right. Why don't one of you guys tell me? Just anybody. Just come at me. Let anyone do anything. Let, let anybody do anything they want with this file. So that's not good. To an image, do it. Yeah. Just do it. Great. Um, you don't want to give things 777. Now, if it's on your own personal computer, on a script you wrote that you will be deleting, then you could probably just do it. I wouldn't, but you could probably get away with it. Um, so let's cover uh, chmod, and we're going to cover kind of basic syntax and what these numbers mean. So you guys don't just chmod 777 because Stack Overflow told you to. Um, and so in file permissions, we have chmod, which is change um, mode. Does it really change mode? All right, cool. Um, and a way to see that is ls-l. It'll give you this random, not random, it'll give you the string of rwx, 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 probably with an underscore at the front of it. Uh, and what that means is there's three groups in Linux by default. You writing this down? Cool beans. So there's three groups in Linux by default. There are owner, group, and other, or all users. Um, I think dash O is the same thing as dash A, right? Uh, dash A is actually UG and O. Okay. So dash A is UG <laughs> and O, which is basically the equivalent of 777, or whatever you're going to be doing. Um, and so dash O is other users. So if it's not me, and they're not in my group, other users can do this. Those are the three choices you have by default based on permission groups. And there's three types. You have read, write, and execute. So these types have a numerical value. I was, I've been saying 777. These types, when you add up, <laughs> include a bunch of permissions. So seven is the sum of all of the types, which means you can read, write, and execute. Uh, read has a numerical value of four, write has a numerical value of two, execute has a numerical value of one. And he's got that written down up there. If you guys can't see that, it's really tiny. He's got R, W, and X, four, two, one. Uh, for users. User, group, and other. Users, you, usually, or owner, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's kind of the basics of chmod. So let's say you want to give a file that you own, 
read and write, and you want to give the group just read, and you want to give other users just read. So now you can do uh, chmod for just yourself. Let's say just yourself right now. You can do chmod g dash uh, r w and x, and that will give you read, write, and execute permissions. That'll yes. give groups. That'll take away yeah, yeah. take away write. group and others. It'll set their permissions to none. <laughs> They won't Actually, have that any. will take away groups, all of groups' permissions. All of groups too. So, if you want to do, if you want to give the group write permissions, what you would say is C G plus W. Okay. Um, if you want to take away the groups' permissions, you could do G minus read write execute. Um, or alternatively, you can just set the mode numerically. So it's you the can easier say, way. For example, six four four. So six doesn't appear in our list of numbers here. Well, if you notice, if you add, read, and write together, you get the number six. As I said, it was the sum, and six is under the you, the user group or the owner. Four is under the group <coughs> permissions. And then four is also under the other, which is anybody else. That doesn't fall under the other two groups, okay. user and owner. Okay. You'll notice that I listed out one more tuple here. So that corresponds to what are called the set UID, the set GID, and the sticky bit. Um, sticky bit prevents people who are not the owner from moving the file or modifying the file. Mm -hmm. um, but the two that are really important for security purposes are set UID and set GID. So set UID says, whenever you're interacting with this file, adopt the effective user of the owner of this file. So for example, if a file is set to executable and set GID is set, or set UID is set, and that file is owned by root, whenever you execute that file, no matter who you are, you execute it as root, okay? Um, a lot of your network utilities used to have to require a set UID in order to be able to interact with the socket layer um, and to make the necessary modifications or look up things on sockets. Uh, so that's why it is potentially dangerous. Um, because what you can do is if then you can somehow exec to another program from that one, you will still have the saved and effective user corresponding to the owner of the file that you exec from. So for those of you who take an operating systems, fork and exec means you just do whatever you, you run another program from within that program saying, I'm still root, let me do whatever I want. So if you can exec an arbitrary program from a program which is set UID, you can now exec any program as root without necessarily being root. You just have to have execute permissions and then you become root automatically upon doing it. Um, one place where set GID does the same thing except for groups. Um, however, there's one thing I want to point out here. So on directories, if you use the set UID and GID flags, what that will do is any files or directories created underneath a current directory, or the directory that has the set UID or the set GID bits, will inherit the user or the group as the default owner instead of the user or owner, user or group, which is the runner, the effective user of the current process. Um, one place where I use that is I have a packaging directory on my computer. And that is set GID for the packaging group on my system. <clears throat> that way, any user which is part of the packaging group can update packages. Um, so. Be very careful where you use these because it widens the area where you can be potentially affected. Surface area. <laughs> uh, so I actually got one more thing on this. Permissions on specific directories, uh, you want to make sure those are nailed down, right? Uh, so your user directory, and since we've already covered the basics, I'm just going to run with the chmod numerical. Your user directory, you want only you to have all of your permissions most of the time. So you're going to want a chmod 700, meaning I am the only person who can do stuff in here. Uh, no groups can do things in here, and other users, I do not want touching my files. Uh, they have no permissions here, do not pass go, do not collect $200. For your bootloader configurations files, uh, you're going to want to remove read and write permissions from the configuration files for all users but root. Uh, so that's another 700 there. Uh, system and 
Damien configuration files. It's super important to restrict rights to those to root. Um, or the appropriate user. Or the appropriate user controlling those. Uh, but you don't necessarily want to remove read permissions. You might want to have other users or some other user in a group look at these. So possibly give other users and the group four permissions. Uh, firewall scripts, so guys, firewall scripts may not always be necessary, uh, but to block all users from, but you still want to have the particular user who's controlling your firewall to have all of the permissions they need. You might not want people to be able to read your firewall, so that's based on your own personal preferences, but they could possibly have read permissions, which would again be four. So buffer overflows. What do you think would happen here with this particular, can everybody read that code or is it too small? Um, so what do you think happens here if I provide a password, which is say 12 characters? The last four are going to be over, over is going to, are going to overwrite the memory. Plus the escape character. Don't forget the escape sure. character. Yeah. So, so what this is gonna end up doing is it's actually gonna set bits inside of login and then if we have a line after this, like if login, where after we check the password. If you manage to set it to true, which is whatever, then you can just log in. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you also have to be careful because sometimes the way the programs are set up, um, like the location in memory could be you know vastly different or a lot closer to certain things even if they're on the program they're fairly close so things like structs are pretty susceptible to this because they like sticking them in the same general vicinity which if you're using c and c plus plus which happen to be terrible with buffer overflow uh that's actually a good way to prevent it is choice of language um c and c plus plus not great uh they're pretty susceptible to buffer overflow in fact they're most of the buffer overflow targets. Uh, interpreted language, um, like Python, they're not as susceptible to buffer overflow because they'll just throw an exception and say, hey, you can't do this. Um, the standard library in C++ is good for bounds checking. So like vector has a dot at function, which will throw an exception if you're past your, past your array, uh, past your memory. Why are you shaking your head? Vector does not do that, however, they do have bounds checked. Yeah, yeah it's, or you have to, the programmer has to <laughs> call at. It'll, it'll throw an out of range exception as far as I'm aware in this STL. If you compiled the STL with dash D um, exceptions, uh, okay. which is not necessarily default. Again, <laughs> back, back to this. Programmer has to <coughs> implement, <coughs> which is why they're weak to them. Uh, again, <laughs> You can implement them correctly. You can use bounds checking. So the use of safe libraries is a good way to stop buffer overflow. And way back in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about OpenBSD. <laughs> they have their own C libraries um, for gets. No, not gets. The string. Their string handling libraries are a lot safer than the standard C library. But they're a little more limited due to that fact. Um, and better string lib is a open source library that is a lot safer than the standard <laughs> C++ libraries. Git, scanf, which you all use, and string copy are unsafe and susceptible to buffer overflow. Uh, pointer protection works to prevent buffer overflow. That's saying uh, having the compiler add code to automatically XOR and code your pointers. Uh, now this pattern can be figured out and then the protection that you have in place is no longer working, but the XORing <laughs> helps to prevent buffer overflow attacks from happening. Um, exploitable space protection. So running arbitrary code on the heap and stack due to a buffer overflow is bad. Uh, again, really bad. So the exploitable space protection says, you can't run arbitrary code here, I'm gonna segfault. And it just doesn't let me do it. Uh, Microsoft actually implemented this back in Windows XP, Service Pack 2, but it wasn't on by default for whatever reason. 
Uh, so they continued to have buffer overflow <laughs> issues with their Microsoft Visual C stuff. And story time. It's back in Jim Jones' class. So buffer overflows. They're actually super useful. How many of you here have homebrewed a wheat? You have. You have. You have. Cool. So you guys all have that fancy homebrew software. That's thanks to a buffer overflow in Twilight Princess that lets you run arbitrary code on the operating system. So you have buffer overflows and crappy programming to thank for all of your pirated software. But So they're not always evil. Most of the time they are. So, so one question you might have is, well, if scanf is so broken, scanf's the only way that I know to read in an integer from standard input. Well, there are actually some ways to do it. There are two ways that you can solve this. One, you can use the allocating versions of these programs, which will then allocate an appropriate buffer of the appropriate size in order to store the thing that you're getting, which is one possible option. Um, that, however, is not POSIX compliant. And for those of us who care about POSIX compliance, there's actually a different way that you can fix this. So you would split the scanf into two separate calls. The first would be a call to the POSIX read function, which allows you to specify the maximum length of a buffer that you're going to read in the data. So you do that first with one value less than the buffer size, because remember, you've got to null terminate your data, people. This is C. Um, then you would use a S scanf on the buffer that you've already allocated. Which is a secure scanf? No, string scan. String? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm wrong. <laughs> Whoops. So that's how you mitigate that particular thing. It's kind of annoying. And actually, in some programs, you'll actually see macros that just do that. Um, if you program in Visual Studio, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> but they actually enforce it, the scanf. Uh, they throw <laughs> compiler errors if you don't. Yeah. So injection. You only thought it was for websites. Ah. <laughs> it's back. Uh, yeah, so injection <laughs> for traditional programming applications follows similar logic to websites. Um, the same prevention methods can be used in most cases, uh, which is data sanitation, um, passing of variables instead of allowing the user to write their own template for stuff. Um, most of the website stuff you use for injection can be implemented effectively in a traditional programming environment. That's really all I got to say about that. Do you have anything else? Um, just be very cautious of anything that allows you to execute arbitrary code. Um, PHP and Python's eval functions. Um, C has a system function. Also, exec is vulnerable, but not quite in the same way. So just be aware that every language has a couple of these things that allow you to access command shells, and you should be sure to sanitize any inputs that you may allow to them. So uh, a nice fact about PHP's regular expression place. <laughs> So you can put flash after a regular expression, like slash g, to match all of them, or slash i to make it uh, not case sensitive. So if you if you put a slash e after it in PHP, guess what that is short for? <coughs> execute. It's execute what ma what the regular expression matches. Oh, gross. So what That's you're one of the worst things in the in the language. Is. <laughs> so what you could do is you could create a user on the database with SQL code match the user SQL code that's in the database and then execute it? Well, so if yeah. you are taking a regex from the user and they can add a slash e, if they can inject regex, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then also regex, regex ddosing is a thing, so you shouldn't do that anyway. Oh, so, yeah, he's anyway. doing the ddosing here in a second. So attack vectors. This is kind of the same thing that we talked about with known vulnerable components. Avoid unnecessary dependencies. If you're adding random dependencies to things, all you're doing is creating more surface area that someone can hack you by. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't use well-established cryptography libraries when you need to, or well-established libraries for interfacing with services that handle the cryptography and the authentication. Um, basically, use your libraries when it makes sense and when you're not going to introduce just random vulnerabilities to avoid scope creep and projects. Um, a good example of this would be the OpenSSL library. How many people have used OpenSSL? <laughs> Practically everyone. So OpenSSL has a bunch of random features that were just kind of added by developers over the years, and no one really ever maintained them. And 
Sounds like Xtrum. Uh, yeah, so basically <laughs> the outcome of that is there's a whole bunch of functions that allow you to execute quasi-arbitrary code inside of OpenSSL, which is why LibreSSL forked from OpenSSL and says, actually, we don't need all of these things. Um, we can work with a smaller subset that we will actually maintain, and it has resulted in cleaner and hopefully safer code. Isn't that where the Harkly bug came from? Um, uh, open, it was a... Was in. V2? <laughs> yeah. So, just kind of keep that in mind when you're writing software. Okay. How many people use dynamic memory allocation functions in C? You all again, do. all of you. So there's three big types of vulnerabilities that you can potentially exploit here, and one of these is going to tie into another one that we're going to talk about in just a second. So. The biggest, scariest one of these is actually use after free. Um, so use after free, somehow someone still has a valid pointer to memory that you've previously freed. Uh -huh. um, and you didn't get rid of the pointer for whatever reason. And because you can still access that information, you may, by some miracle, get valid data. Or you could actually sometimes seg fault, which is bad, or you can allow someone to put in arbitrary data there because they just write stuff to that address and then they execute it and because it's no longer part of the heap it may not be protected by no execute on the heap um, so just be very wary of any time that you use a pointer to make sure that once you freed it nothing else accesses it ever again some of this can be fixed with stack analysis um, but it's not going to catch everything another potentially dangerous one is a double free um, on some operating systems, this will immediately seg fault. I believe Linux currently defines this to a seg fault, but POSIX actually says the behavior is unspecified. You get very scary things on Linux when you double free. You just get library stack traces. <laughs> yeah. So avoid double freeing things. And the easiest way to do that is have a very well-defined life cycle for a particular library or program so that you know exactly when an object will be freed and exactly when it will come into creation. Um, memory leaks doesn't initially sound like a huge security issue, but actually what you can do is you can get into this next type of vulnerability that we're going to be talking about, which are resource bombs, where essentially if you can force a program to leak a certain amount of memory, even if it's not very much, you just cause it to leak a certain amount of memory a lot, and eventually you'll take up so much resources that the program will literally die. Um, this causes what's generally referred to as a denial of service attack. So you're basically taking up so many resources that you're denying other people access to the program. Other types of resource bombs that you may encounter on a frequent basis would be fork bombs. Um, fork bombs, while true fork malloc a thousand. So that will just continuously like split and exponentially allocate a thousand bytes every single time it forks so and it'll keep on doing that that <laughs> might not actually break your computer unless you write something to that malloc so you might just be mallocing to virtual memory <laughs> and the computer be like all right whatever but if you attempt to write to that then bad things happen so if you're for whatever purposes you guys want to use it make sure you write <clears throat> stuff into that malloc so the memory will actually the computer will actually give it to you Otherwise, it's just going to say you have 16,000 terabytes in memory, but you really don't. Yeah. So resource bombs. Another thing that could potentially be bad is exponential expansion. So how many of you have worked with XML? So how many of you knew that there's something called entity expansion in XML? I see a few bless hands. So entity expansion says this arbitrary piece of XML right here, I'm going to create a pointer to that. So anytime I talk about this pointer, expand that pointer to the XML to which it points. Talk about the pointer a lot. So if you say that, for example, A is equal to lol, and then B is equal to the reference of A, let's say, 100 times, and then B or C is equal to the reference of B, say, 100 times. Yeah. And then D is equal to the reference of C a couple thousand times. Mm 
You now have a lot of <laughs> words. So this paragraph here, ex if you only do 10 times, expands to four gigabytes of data. Okay, so something that's less than 144 characters expands to a gigabyte of data. That's why it's called the billion last vulnerability. Um, if you just expand this a little bit though, it gets even grosser because if you do 100, then you went from like four gigs up to, I think it's like several terabytes or petabytes of data. Exponential And something that you can literally send and type out on your cell phone without like getting carpal tunnel or being really frustrated. So, I have no earthly idea why XML included this particular feature. Because it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but essentially, you can just resource bomb things like that. Zip bombs, um, mm -hmm. Zip bombs do the same thing. Um, you Those can also your hard drive. You can also have lentil Z explode things where you have something that like compressed down to like a single byte or maybe like three bytes in lentil Z compression. It's like several gigabytes otherwise. Um, so anything where you like it can expand to something exponentially larger than the thing that you started with is something that you should potentially be concerned about. The last one that I'm going to talk about, um, or one other one I'm going to talk about is exponential runtime expansion. So this is where you parse something and then the way that you parse that is by recursively parsing it, but you parse the whole list through every single time you parse it. Um, there was recently a commit to the Linux kernel where in the network code, they would actually reference, whenever you removed a network device node, it would actually iterate through every device a factorial number of times um, before it removed it. <laughs> yeah. That so, was committed? Yeah, that was committed. Um, they replaced it with an order in squared algorithm instead of factorial running time. But that's <laughs> something that you potentially have to worry about. Um, you can also, how many of you have taken Dr. Dean's 212 class? Okay. So in Dr. Dean's 212 class, he traditionally gives an assignment where he calls it the adversarial programmer, where you try to design the intentional worst case input to either a randomized algorithm or um, like a bubble sort or a quick sort. So if someone's thinking that they're clever by saying, oh, well, you just do this, and you know, most of the time it shouldn't be bad. Well, if you know what that is or can reasonably guess how they're doing it, you might be able to create or craft an intentional worst case input, taking something that would normally be say order n to something that would then be say order of n squared. And if n is say a million, n squared becomes like really long <laughs> and really obnoxious. Um, so writing effective code and clearly understanding the algorithmic implications of what arbitrary inputs could have to your code is an important thing to consider, especially with regard to resources. So in traditional programming, resources <laughs> are a commodity that you want to spend wisely, is basically the gist of the last two slides. Okay. So some further resources to look at would be the OS Top 10. Also, they publish a series of cheat sheets which provide summaries of both what these vulnerabilities could look like in common languages, cough, cough, PHP. Um, but also some other languages, as well as techniques that you can use to mitigate and fix them. They also have cheat sheets on a variety of other topics. I would really recommend just, if you have some time to sit down and just read computer science stuff, I mean, I know I do. Um, it's a really good and a really interesting read. So at this time, we'd like to open it up for any questions that you all may have. I can show this right. Ad does provide balance checking. Okay. Good for you, Foster. Good for me. <laughs> How does uh, ASLR affect what we're Okay, so ASLR. So ASLR, the idea behind that is instead of starting the stack at basically the next available spot, you start it at a randomized spot. So if the stack is not where you expect it to be, it becomes much harder to overwrite things in the stack. Random address spaces? Um, so if you think about a stack, like you have stuff in the stack, right? Um, well, that stack in virtual memory is being mapped to some segment of actual hardware memory. So normally what you do is you have like the operating system and then you have maybe program one, program two has a stack and there's so much space on that stack which this is getting mapped down into. With ASLR, instead of just mapping it to like the next consecutive open spot, 
you kind of hash this to some specified location. So while you may have like a still a fixed size stack, like in terms of where it's getting stored on physical memory, you're not necessarily just going sequentially through the stack. You're instead choosing random places to put that stack memory. Now, if your hashing algorithm <laughs> is, again, we've covered a few times, predictable, <coughs> then you that can, can also have still have problems. Which is how people have mitigated, how exploits have started to mitigate against ASLR. They do something like binary search to find the beginning of the stack. And then once they've <coughs> binary searched and found the beginning of the stack, then they can start doing stuff with that. So with that process, it's almost kind of like a linked list almost where, you know, the next stack, member of the stack is, you know, pointed to by some memory or pointed to by... <laughs> You know, some hash or something. Yeah, it's not usually implemented as a linked list, but the, the idea... It's a good conceptual model of what yeah. that would look like. Yeah, so you have some list of stacks as opposed to just consecutive sections. Of a list instead of an array, yeah. 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 So, Parker, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I was gonna, yeah, so ASL, ASLR randomizes the address space. What it's, I don't know if you want to see it. So, you know, it's address uh, space layout randomization. Usually, you should look into what's called return-oriented programming about uh, bypassing that. Bypassing the return to go into the code that shouldn't be ran anymore. Yeah. So, return-oriented programming is basically um, usually when you exploit something, you part of your exploit contains code that you want it to run. So, usually, this is shell code. So, you'll give it something that will like execute the shell as root. So, then you can get in and run commands that you want. So, throughout various uh, preventative, preventative measures that have been taken for exploits like that, you won't be able to get it to execute shellcode because it'll be in a memory area that's marked with NX, which is not executable. So uh, both AMD processors and Intel ones won't execute the shellcode if it's user submitted because it'll be marked as non executable in memory. So what return-oriented programming does is instead of uploading your own code, it, uh, you have to use code that's already in the program as assembly instructions. So like if, what, if your code executed like these 50 assembly instructions, what you want to do instead is find those 50 instructions in the executable that's already on the computer and marked as executable. And then you just basically can get a Turing complete implementation of your assembly language by using returning, like to execute one in the return and, and so on. And so uh, then you have to look at control flow integrity to get past that. But also I was gonna It's mention, a really complicated program. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 they, they did something similar to that with the virus called the Frankenstein virus. It's essentially, you know, same same process. Instead of having, you know, creating your own, you know, shell code, you simply say, find these lists of instructions on the computer and execute them in order. Yes, yeah, so you can have, their programs will do it for you, just like everything else. So you don't actually need to know what you're doing. There's, Those you know, are my favorite kind of programs. Like 500,000 lines of source code, just like, like how IDA is, can do anything with assembling. Sometimes you don't have to know what you're doing because it's so good. Uh, and I was also going to mention when you said XML, XML also has an external entities tag, which will pull in ex do arbitrary requests, so yes. it's easy to do server-side request for review and stuff like that. Which is yet another reason you should avoid XML. Um, Other than the fact that it hurts to look at. Also, parsing XML takes at least, I think it's order n squared, but in some cases, like order n cube time. There's, there's no good reason to use it. Yeah, so be very cautious about using XML, and if you can use something simpler, you probably should. Any other questions? <laughs> I know Comments, it's late. concerns, limericks, haikus, or puns? There's always puns, so we probably shouldn't start with those. Probably not. All right.